In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, for allowing us to gather here to think about your scripture and to learn more deeply who you are. Open the ears of our hearts that we hear your voice, come to know you, and may learn to love you more deeply day by day. We entrust this time to you through the hands of our mother as we say, Hail Mary. O oh, Lord, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Moses is kind of an important figure, and there's a lot of stuff that he did, a lot of stuff that's in the scriptures, um, and a lot of things to cover and talk about were on this back surface. Uh, that's okay. Um, but we're going to divide into at least two days. Hopefully we can get through, through these three pages a day. We'll see. Um, we're going to hopefully cover the first 12, 11 chapters um, get prepared for the 12th chapter of Exodus, the Passover. Um, but look at Moses' own life and all of Moses and the ten plagues, but not the nine plagues um, today. At the beginning of Exodus chapter 1, you know, we've gone to the story of Joseph. We've gone to the fact that Joseph is this great important figure. He was the savior of Egypt, the savior of the world, really. And then you come to this fact that new Pharaoh comes along who doesn't know Joseph. And I, I believe that the implication of the that he doesn't know him literally in terms of his knowledge, it's a different fact. Uh, whether this one was conquered, whether the line died out, it's not clear. Uh, there's different theories. One theory is there was an uprising and another person took another house to power. And so this was part of his consolidating power, was to get rid of the old, the old Pharaoh's attachments and, and the people who were involved. But he deals with the Hebrews shrewdly, the scripture says. Why do you think he deals with them shrewdly, secretly? Why not open the Pharaoh? He's the, he's the, he's the, he's the God king. Right? Why not just say, you know, you all are scum and I'm the king and I'm the son of Rod and do not. Oh, kiss my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot more of them than there were Egyptians. A lot more of them. Yeah. You also had, again, I think also you had the fact you would have had intermarriage right, between the, the, the Hebrews and the Hebrews. So we've had power families who would have been involved in this. Mm -hmm. You also have had the fact that something that's as cruel, you have a new king, and if you've seen as cruel a timer, people aren't going to respond to all that. So having secret policies prevents some of these uprisings, prevents some of these things. It begins with a little bit of a letter. We see kind of a echo of this in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, do you remember, I forget the chapter, excuse me, I apologize. In the Gospel of Matthew, the, um, the Pharisees ask our Lord, do you pay the temple tax? And our Lord asks them, who pays taxes? Is it the citizens or is it foreigners? And the answer is, well, foreign to Spain. The children are exempt. And so the levy, the levy here is that, that tax, foreign tax. You're living here, we're giving you a place to live, we're supporting you, you're, you're taking our jobs, our work, therefore you pay tax. That's how it begins. Then it goes on from there. And so it goes on is that this tax. Then it becomes more and more strict. So, I mean, again, it happened right away. Boom, your slaves, the uprisings. But it begins with, you know, it's not unreasonable. You know, so you support us, we live here. You grumble a bit, but you do it. But it begins slowly, it gets more and more strict. And you get, goes from being, a, being that this tax, that there's tax passage over. And then there is a policy that he talks to your midwives, and he secretly tells them, go kill all the human all boys. And they lie. You know, they say, "Oh, I don't know what happened." He, he, those Hebrew women—they're just too strong. You know, they, they, 
They give birth before we get there. You know, not like the Egyptians. Paris. <laughs> 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 you get kind of the impression that that bears not out of his death here when it comes to women things. You know, <laughs> just, okay, you know. <laughs> and that's the Hebrew numerals. And then the people become afraid. So there, there, there is this campaign of fear. They're going to overthrow us, they're foreigners, not one of us, they're with us. And over time, they become slaves. And then there is this program, everybody's told, kill them. Kill the children. Kill the baby This seems to end after a period of a little while. It doesn't seem to be going on uh, after Moses adopted. Um, coincidence or not, again, if you were to speak to the, the look of the Jewish myth, they would say it's not coincidence. They would say it's very much because of our Lord's of God's intervention and Moses' intervention and his mother's intervention. Who knows? But it, it appears to be last for a short time. Um, spiritually, you would say the devil is there trying to destroy Moses, trying to keep them a slave, trying to write God's plans. And so the Lord works miracles in ordinary ways. Um, Moses has an interesting life. And in some ways, I would say that mere Joseph and almost backwards. Right? Joseph begins. That is kind of this ordinary kid, kind of low down, snotty teenager, becomes a slave, becomes a prisoner, then becomes a prince. Moses, his last days are the beginning, then becomes a prince. And then he flees and becomes this, he kind of ends his life as this wandering, you know, rag, you know, the other world's point of view is he's wandering, not rag, rag, you know. Um, but we would say he's a great leader, he's a great you know, saint, he's a great prophet. From world's point of view, he ends his life, wandering in the desert for 40 years, doesn't make his, his goal. His goal is to reach the promise. He doesn't see it. When he sees it, he's like, enter into it. So from the world's point of view, it's almost, you see, you would see almost to be a fall from power, from glory. He just kept to his guns, he kept his mouth shut, he could have given Pharaoh. But instead, he ends up, you know, leading these escaped slaves and dying before he reaches his journey. Mm -hmm. What you have here, in some ways, though, an even greater rise than Joseph. Right? Joseph ends his days simply being a member of, of, of Pharaoh's court. Moses ends his days the saint, the prophet, when he sees God face to face. The greatest prophet who lived, with the exception of our Lord, of course. Um, so much so, the little transfiguration, we'll read this reading this Sunday, um, who appears to our, who appears with our Lord is transfigured? Moses. Right? Up on the mountain. As some scholars say that. You know, when it talks about Moses on the mountain on Sinai, literally he was seeing Christ. Literally, this was this one was a a glimpse of what Moses saw. The boat lines up on, on, on uh, Mount Hor or Mount Carmel, um, and he sees God. Certain saints say we literally see his Christ. It's the transfiguration is almost this bending of time and space, where Moses is seeing Christ. In the flesh, where Elijah is seeing Christ in the flesh, and that's why the apostles see Moses and Elijah. A theory, don't have to believe it, but a theory. But, but and so he ends his, his his days being able to preparing the way he is the, the lawmaker. He he is the great prophet who speaks God face to face. He establishes the law and the covenant. He he is the one who gives the Jewish people their identity. And their the form of how they follow and serve and worship God. Beautiful, wonderful story. Moses is born into slavery, and I think we all have seen movies or read the story. Most of the story, but there's another piece there that just kind of visually is put in the basket. 
you know, set free on the river and it was basically more dramatic. Not quite what's going on there. Um, he's placed for the Russians. So there's not going to be the dangerous animals there. Um, and it's not going to flow down the river. Um, hopefully someone's going to be fine. And if, as, as certain writers believe, um, this would have been a kind of a, a bathing area or the steps, and especially the Maya Palace, you know, this very much, it's quite possible Moses' mother knew exactly what she was doing, was hoping to not go to the palace and would find him for that he could be able to be. As opposed to this kind of blind chance, pushing down the river and hope for the best. Um, <laughs> you know, doesn't score, doesn't say that, but that seems to be the implication. Um, in Jewish tradition, Pharaoh's daughter has the name Bethiah. Yeah. Um, Jewish tradition could be false, could be wrong. Um, I'm a, little, I'm a little skeptical myself because it's a Hebrew name. Um, so not very likely, but it could have been a nickname she had that Moses gave her. It could have been, so who knows? Um, it's not beyond the pale. Literally, what it means is daughter of Yahweh. Um, so again, probably not likely. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, again, it could, it could have been. It could have been a nickname, but this is the tradition. She's not named in the scripture, but she's given that name in Jewish tradition, in Jewish life. Uh, she's considered a pious old woman you know, who protects Moses and uh, something else. Did they think maybe that that God spoke to her or something? Yeah, yes, Jewish, and, like, Jewish tradition, her. yes. Yes, Jewish tradition, God shows her a picture and designated her as much as his blessings and everything else. Um, and certainly God picked her, um, right? I mean, but whether he picked her in this way, he would have been giving, revealed himself to her in the same way. I mean, she, she kind of disappears after this. Um, she's not, not told a lot. So again, there's a lot of Jewish legends and stories at this time. Um, and they're interesting, but they're like this. You know, and they're not, I'm trying to think. This is probably similar to some of the stories we have of uh, like Dismas, um, the, the good thief. So there are pious stories that... But not uh, necessary. Not... Not necessary for the... Right, right. Uh, but, but there are pious, there's a pious story, for example, the good thief, the good thief, according to one, one traditional legend, the good thief met the family, family fleeing to Egypt. And even though it was a thief, he fed them and sheltered them, and that's why he was blessed. They later on, he was dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. Nice story. Could have been happened. <laughs> Probably didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know, great. You know, it's not going to affect him. It's not going to. You can believe it 100%. It's a beautiful thing to believe, it's a beautiful story. Uh, but it's a story. And it's, it doesn't come from any uh, source that seems to be a story of the case. So, but. For the sake of calling her something, you can call her Bethiah. <laughs> um, the Bethiah was found to bathe with her maids to see a basket, and she adopts the, uh, the baby. And immediately, Moses' sister Miriam comes along and says, no, You need a wet nurse. I can make a nice one for you. <laughs> and the Pharaoh's daughter says, That's a great idea, and she has. He sends him back basically to deliver this, his mom until he's about three or four years old. So, two or three years old. You know, so again, you can't, you can't just get this idea, just kind of this, she's royal, right? I mean, so she's being taken off to a wet nurse, and the wet nurse doesn't come to live with them. The kid gets sent back, gets really his old and he's not going to be, be, be a bar. You know, it's just, it's amusing to me. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll pay you to raise him, and when he's weaned, come bring him back. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> 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 well, it'd be better if it was like the teenage years, though. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Send him away then for a few yeah, years. Yeah, but what you do? You have to be really wealthy from that. <laughs> <laughs> Super wealthy. Yeah. Um, Private school. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and so that to me becomes where he's raised. And it appears that he's raised knowing both the Egyptian culture, knowing the Egyptian law, his easy, easy friends. But he also seems to know very well who he, where he comes from. He knows the adult. He knows that he knows who his kin are, knows who his family is. That's all we're told. We're not told how, we're not told what that means, we're not told was he was down upon there anyone else, we're not told was he outcast his own home, we're not told was he his entire life going out and advocating you know, for the Hebrews. There's legends about it. There's a nice Jewish legend where before the, the uh, founding of the covenant, Moses went to Pharaoh and said, either even slaves the day off every you know, little while once in a while. So <laughs> He got them to Sabbath day off before the Sabbath day, every, every seventh day. Could have happened. It's a nice legend. Um, other legends, he's always, always doing this. And we certainly see that, that when the time comes, when he is an adult, when he, when he is a man, he does go visit the slaves, his kinsmen. And when he sees one of his kinsmen being struck and attacked by an Egyptian, he defends him physically and kills him. And then he's, hides the money. he hides him. And then when he finds out people start knowing about him, he runs away. He runs off in the desert to land of Midi, please Egypt. And so there's something, tell me, he's a connection. Right? I mean, so even though he was his prince, he had a connection with his family all along. He knows where he is, he knows who Mariam is, he knows who his mother is. But we're, we're, we're given very good details. Then, while well, he's over in Midian, he goes sitting by, by a well, and there are seven young women who go to water part of their sheep. And ordinarily, um, they have to wait until the, the other shepherds come. This is one of the places where there's only water in certain places and one big well. And they can't water the sheep until the shepherds come and water their sheep first. They make the girls wait. These they, nice gallant men do that. <laughs> and Moses comes and protects them and defends them and waters them first. So that when they go to their back to their dad Jethro, he says, Well, you're home early. How can you come so early? And they said, well, because this, this man came and offended us, and he bought our sheep for us, and he was very nice to us. And they response why are you leaving there? Go bring him back. <laughs> you know, and he ends up becoming, um, marrying one of the, one of the, of the seven daughters, names of There's different spellings of this, but close enough. For 40 years, he's a shepherd. For 40 years, he's, spent, he's living in the Whitney. He's living um, an outcast. He has some kids and children, and for, he is, he's kind of the definition of a second location, like location. Right? So, 50, 60 years old, a little older. Um, I think in one tradition, he's 80. Um, He's doing his ordinary day routines, but only longer than the shepherd. He was a prince. And all of a sudden, he sees the world go. He's curious. Well, that's interesting. What go see those? What's that? What's that? And God speaks. To him. God calls him and says, "I'm going to go deliver the Hebrew people from being their, their slavery. You go and tell Pharaoh. You go tell Pharaoh. Let my people go. That's going to be you know so." <laughs> Shocking news for you. Let's look at something more detail. And then we know the story where he goes and he's refused there's, there's a place. Let's look at some of these things a little more closely. What is Moses' name? Here's the thing. It all depends on whether we derive it from the Hebrew. Moshe, which means Savior, Deliverer, which would seem to make sense. And perhaps that was something he earned later on, it was called this way. Um, some people say, well, but, but 
Why would he build a Hebrew name? And there's a couple theories. One theory says he's called a Hebrew name because he was with his mother for two or three years. His mother called him that, and uh, Matthias accepted it. Okay, his name's off at school. You know, that uh, she liked the name, it's the usual name, nice name, and took it. But it also says in the book of Exodus, he's called that because he was drawn out of the water. And so some theories say that Moses is a shortened form form of an Egyptian. So Ramses is actually a short version of Ramos, meaning son of Ram. It's just mm -hmm. a common way of doing things. You have other names like that. You have Tutmosis. Son of Tut, the god Tut. So would Moses' name be something like Ram well, Moses, the son of the Nile, the son of the water? Perhaps. The drawn out of the water, saved in the water, born in the water? Maybe. Moses in Hebrew by itself was seen son. And some people say, well, that's because he had no parentage. He was an orphan. Not really, but as far as the Egyptians knew, he was an orphan. And so there's seen the son of nobody. Um, so the answer is we don't really know which one it is. It could be any of these, none of these, all of um, Is it a version of Egyptian where after he became co follower of God, he dropped off the God name, the God name. He just became Moses. Or maybe he was son of the Nile or son of the God of the Nile or son of whatever. And he dropped off that name and he left Egypt. Perhaps. Is it possible that he was given a Hebrew name because he lived with his mother? Perhaps. Is it possible that... <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so it's one of those things where there is debate in Christian legend. I'm not sure it matters a whole lot, but it's interesting to know, know what's out there, know the differences, know, know what, what was the things mean. Um, spiritually, we have here then, in my mind, we have here is something. Um, so, so, this is my theory. So, take us with my soul as well. Sprinkle my soul. <laughs> <laughs> my theory is we have here God using natural events for supernatural means. I think he began the son of the Nile River, son of the river, and then because he became the great founder, was dropped off. And a meaning, Savior and Lord. So his name went from being the son of these gods to Savior. So it went from being Egyptian to Hebrew. Had his roots in the Egyptian, became the reject of the gods, became then this salvation Savior, pointing to the true God, pointing to God himself. And he becomes, therefore, a figure of Christ, who is the Savior, the deliverer from sin, from slavery, and from fact, the devil. Um, but one of those things was the rain is Is Moses something referred to in uh, other stories by those names or by other names other than Moses? Not as far as we found. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe perhaps somewhere else he is, but nothing not we found or seen. Or um, it's always Moses. It's always Moses. So yeah. we're reading through the Bible, then we're always yeah. going to see Moses as yeah. Moses. Moses Moses, yeah. Okay. And because he wrote it, or, or he compiled it, or someone wrote it, um, perhaps Joshua wrote it, you know, this disputation, after all this example. And so the people who knew you or, or you were talking to are going to know you as you are now. Right? And so if I were to tell the story of my childhood, I want to be in my in the third person, I want to say, you know, so my family called me Nacro. But everyone here knows me as well called Rock. If I was talking about my childhood, I would say, Father Block grew up. I would say, Nat grew up. <laughs> right? Even though I wasn't Father Block when I was you know, three years old. <laughs> now, we'll talk about Father Block three years old. <laughs> and so, because he's the one talking and referring to these things, that's who knew him. Even if he was called something else, he wouldn't tell him that. Um, and it wasn't 
a big deal to him wasn't an important thing, especially if it was something that was transformed by his seeing God, knowing God, his encounter with God. It would have been something that would have been changed. Um, question on this? The book of Hebrews goes a lot further into Moses' recognition of his, of his kid, right? recognition of, of his family. Uh, we know that there was language and customs, we know he recognized his siblings, we know that he was mom. That's scriptural. The book of Hebrews, also scriptural, the Old Testament, says this. Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, most of you refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather the share of treatment the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Right? He fled Egypt, he fled away, he was defending his, his people. He considered abuse for his suffering for Christ, greater wealth, the treasures of Egypt, with a two or more. By faith, he did not being afraid of the anger of the king. For he endured of seeing him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood to destroy the firstborn, but not touch that. So according to the two, Paul, who I would say is a good source, <laughs> Moses, even as a young man, had at least touched a touch of faith and understanding of who God was. And, under, and was being called at that, at that moment. Did he go too far? Yeah. But he was choosing to follow God even then. He was choosing to be associated with the slaves. He was choosing to be associated with his people. He was walking with them, protecting them, defending them. And according to Paul, he flees Egypt not because he's scared, because he's simply afraid, not because he's trying to hide his crime, but to follow God. And so we have here again God using these events, using these things, to work great good. Interesting here, we, you know, we have another story that's very personal and very focused upon one person. And so we hear we have here this, we are being told now, being shown, that God is interested in us individuals. God knows our stories, individuals, and uses the things we do with our mistakes and our sins to do great good. God prepares us. Most of us are prepared for 40 years. It looks like he's been forgotten. It looks like he's been abandoned. But God's preparing and preparing the time until everything happens, happens the way until everything's ready. Uh, I notice in verse 28, yes. uh, it talks about keeping the Passover. Yes. Is that after the events, or how is that? Is it just compressing a whole bunch of. It's compressing a whole bunch of, a bunch of, a bunch of, a bunch of Yeah. We're going to keep the Passover until after he came back. Uh, that's, that, that's the last plank. Um, so there's the ten plagues, the last plague. Um, so yeah, compressed a bunch of times. Okay. Yeah. Good. So Moses is anywhere from middle aged old, <laughs> and he gets called. And Moses, when he's called, is actually refuses the call five times. He finds excuses, he finds the reasons, he puts God off. He doesn't want this. Right? If you were trying to write a story of how you know the ordinary human way of thinking, you want a story where Moses was this great, amazing person his entire life. Moses always said the right thing. Moses was always you know, knew what he needed to do. He was a great eloquent speaker. But like the story of the apostles, they put the foot in their mouth, where they get called by themselves, make mistakes. That's the story of Moses as well. He's this great, amazing saint, great figure. The very ordinary man, a shepherd. He was a priest, an exiled prince. He doesn't want to go back to Egypt. He doesn't want to go back you know, to, to talk to Pharaoh. And so he sees 
this burning bush. And God calls and says, Moses, take his hands off your feet. Notice here, it's not again, we've talked about this, 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 this same theme we've seen before, the shepherd thing, and also who calls. God calls. Moses says, look for God, and then God responds. God calls him. God seeks him out. God insists on him. Heaven. <laughs> And the first thing that, that's what God says to Moses, come close, come close, take off your feet, feet up, take off your shoes, because you're standing up on the ground. This is where you have, uh, from these passages, for example, that the Muslims won't wear shoes in their, in their temples, and even the Lord God won't wear shoes uh, in, in their churches, because of the presence of God. You wanna, you're, you're barefoot, you're, you're standing completely uncovered. Bad labor and cover for God, exposed and, and in front of him. He says to, to Moses, I have heard my people's cry. You know, Moses thinking, well, it's about time. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and I'm going to go send you to go, I'm going to deliver from the Pharaoh, I'm sending you to go and speak and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. To tell them to go, let my people go on a three day journey in the wilderness to offer me sacrifice. Moses first he says, wait, who am I? Wait a minute, whoa, whoa. Hold it. Who am I? I'm nobody. And I could have said, no, you're a prince, to so go back and shut up. <laughs> he didn't say it. He says, Moses, don't worry about it. I'm going to be with you. I'm with you. I'm with you, protected with you. I am the creator of the universe. I'm with you. You'll have my power, my authority, go to Pharaoh. Moses responds, <laughs> well, wait a minute. When I tell my, my, my people, you know, that sent, they want to know who sent. What does I tell them? He's put it on. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I am who I am. I'm the I'm he was. Tell the people I am. Send me to you. If you have here the first time here where God knows his name, his being, his essence to his people. Look at this a little bit. And this isn't just a God, this isn't just a divine being, it's not just a angel. This is the God that created the universe. This is the God that made all things, who sustains all things, who was with Adam and Eve. I am is with you. Go. Moses well, goes back and says, wait a minute, you know what? But if I go to Pharaoh, you know, I'm a nobody. You're going to say, prove it to me. Prove it to me you were sent. I like, how do I prove that I was sent? I'm just going to go tell Pharaoh, okay, by the way, you know, <laughs> I know you're, you're just, neither your economy is built upon these slaves. Let them go, take some time off, and uh, yeah, we're, we'll come back in a minute. You know, they, it was three days journey, which means they'll be gone for at least a week. We'll come back, uh, but you can trust us. How, how do I prove that you don't want to send me? And God gives him two signs. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two miracles. You can just call upon whatever you want. And the first miracle is you can cast down the staff, the ordinary staff, and turn to a snake. And Moses does it and he goes, whoa, and he runs away and goes back to pick it up again. His back is back to the staff. The second thing he can do is simply by his wishing it, puts his hand under his cloak, comes out, Looking like, looking like the white leprosy, puts it back in and gets cured. These two signs. Now go, Moses, go. He says, well, wait, you know, <laughs> but Lord, I'm still on time. I'm not a good eloquent speaker. I, I'm not a good speaker. You don't want to, why do you want to send me? I sympathize with the opposite. Um, <clears throat> And God's response is, but I made the tongue. I made the mouth. I made the man go. I've chosen you. And then Moses just, just resorts to pleading. <laughs> Lord, anyone but me. To anybody else, don't send me. Why are you picking me? And somebody else. And God is saying, He says, I'm going to have your brother go with you. You speak to Aaron. Aaron will speak for you. You, you shall be as uh, God to Aaron, and Aaron shall be as your priest. 
So you already have here the setting up of the priesthood. And so you have here, you know. How do you know God was angry? It's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it has got, it, it's not punished, he's not yelled at, he's not you know, struck down with anything, but it says God is upset. He's making excuses. And so he's praised for being meek. He's considered the most humble man of all. Some of, some of this is genuine humility, but he goes too far. He's come so humble, he's afraid to go. Anything with that, don't, don't send me. Moses, who got from that? And finally, he goes. <coughs> and we have here, here again, for, for a. a uh, a human story or a myth. But you would have you'd have someone charge enough for the right way. You'd have someone say, I'm sent by God, here you go. It's not what happened. <laughs> you have here a man that's afraid. You have here a man hesitates. You have here a man who says, No, oh, I can't speak. I'm a nobody. I know who you are. Don't listen to me. The Lord don't send me. And it's like three chapters where the Lord is just, just Moses. <laughs> I'm going to see you, I'm going to live you, I'm going to save you, I'm going to protect your people, I'm going to things be exciting news. Lord, but don't send The thing is, this is a very human thing. We love the idea of God coming to us and visiting us in his mission in the abstract. We love the idea of God coming to us and speaking to us and telling us, do these right things. They happen to somebody else. They happen on our schedule. They happen when it's convenient. They happen without too much trouble. But see, following God is giving up everything. Following God means being able to give him Not on my schedule, on my means, on my time, on my watch. Not when I like it. And so Moses has to, this is Moses having him to give up and give in and die to himself. This is Moses having to trust God. Or just having to learn to go with fears. Or just have learning how to say, no, I, I know God. I'm going to let God be with me. And again, from a human standpoint, you would, you would say, well, why does God choose him? Why just say, okay, you idiot, fine, go back to being a shut up or I'll pick somebody else? He could have picked Aaron. He could have picked um, anybody. Could have picked Moses' you know, big time, and his daughter mother. <laughs> he picks this guy who fights the vocation. And still gets called, still gets led, still gets invited. And, and that was something I've only recently picked up on, not being very familiar with this, is it was kind of a package deal. You kind of touched on it with Aaron, the... the Simple version, I guess, was Moses did all this stuff, but it was more like these two guys went and did all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was Moses. Like Moses was the, the support, the background when he did all the spiritual stuff, and Aaron did all the physical, like external stuff. Um, he's the one who spoke to the people. He's the one who did the worship. He's the one who was kind of the face, the public face. He, you know, he he would be the uh, you know, the figurehead, you know, of everyone else. Moses was the one. Behind the scenes, because that was what was what. He's just, you know, he doesn't want to be known. That's what he's saying. He's just the shy, humble guy. So Aaron's the poster child. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he, he's the one. I mean, again, everyone knows they're together. But when they speak to Pharaoh, it's, it's usually not. I mean, it says Moses. But usually, it's not even Moses. It's just Aaron. Yeah. Just give, giving the words. You know, um, usually, usually it's gonna be Aaron. You know, it's part of the reason why we go with the calf when Moses is around, Aaron got all apart. <laughs> because Aaron didn't have a relationship with God the same way. Again, Aaron's a, Aaron's a saint, but he is on issues too. <laughs> issues too. Uh, let's look at a couple different things now with God's name. Questions so far just for the one. With God's name. <clears throat> I am who I am. 
Now, I know with other classes, with some of you, I have talked about this before, so this is a repeat for some of you. Um, I think it's important to be a In Hebrew, Yahweh is I am the way. One of the things that I just find so beautiful about, about Hebrew, this particular word, is in the Hebrew there are no vowels in that ancient Hebrew. Vowels get invented about the 600 AD. And because they're so light, and because the Bible is a sacred book, which is where he was preserved, and it was why people learned Hebrew, because even the time of Christ, Hebrew wasn't spoken. Hebrew wasn't spoken from Babylon until modern, modern, modern Hebrew was a little different. Modern Hebrew was, was reinvented, realigned. It, it was that language. Um, it was only it was used for, for prayer, for liturgy, but no one spoke. It was it was uh, it was it was reproduced after um, World War II. Um, so modern Hebrew is like their language. They actually were having no vowels. In the sixth century, they invented vowels. But because it was, a, it was a sacred language, they didn't really want to change the words. So what they did was they added vowels above and then below and around. They didn't do the words. So they would, uh, so the word I is this, I mean. That's the vowels. With the vowels, <coughs> It's that. Um, so it's the same letters, the same form, but you scatter these different things around it to make the sounds, to show, to show it's the, those other sounds. Um, why am I talking about this? Because in Hebrew, depending on how you pronounce this word, you can translate it into any different combination of tenses. This word is a beautiful word, it's so cool, it's a little word for Hebrew, where you could translate it as, I am who I am, I will be who will be, I will be who I am, I was who will be, I was who was, I was who will be, any combination. All of these combinations could be translated into this word. See, even with the, for the letters themselves, you have this list of eternity. Even these letters themselves, because there are no vowels, you get the idea of eternity because it can translate it to all the tenses. Fit into this one word. Was that constructed or was that the intention originally to have? It's, well, it's God's name. What, that too. So, um, the, it's one of those things where there's, well, certainly there was a correct pronunciation, but it was for God and lost. The point where in the Middle Ages, um, there's a legend of the golem. So the golem is a Jewish fairy. And the rabbi would try to discover how was God to argue? How is the, the God's name not sacred to trauma God? Four letters. Um, how, how, how was God's name really pronounced? And one Jewish fairy tale, this, this is a, a myth, was that one rabbi discovered the secret and do it, and it was, it was so powerful that you could make these clay figures and put a scroll with the nail of God written in their mouth <coughs> to come to life. And so the golem were these clay figures that had life because they had God's name inside of them. Um, because the fact is, it was not a pronounced God's name. There is debate and argument how you pronounce God's name. This is a nice English translation as the point of cross. This is probably, you know, the, the idea is he is the eternal one, the ever existing one. But the actual construction of the letters and the name, what all happened in Hebrew, is the letters themselves, the word itself, comes across with this idea of eternity. Present, past, future, all wrapped into one. Which is pretty darn cool. Yeah. Very cool. 
Um, and so what you have here then is, is see, a name A name is more than a title to Hebrews. When Moses is asking for a name, Moses is thinking more in a modern age sense. A title. What do I call you? It's looking like it's Bob. You know, <laughs> Bob sent me to you. you know. And God answers with his nature and his being. No one gives God a name. Right? To give someone a name requires authority over Require someone to name them. God is in some sense nameless because he's the eternal one. He simply is. I am the human. I am, I am the lamb. I am the one who exists of myself. And so what God says is his essence of his being, which is his name, but it's not a name like our names. Because this is what he is. This is a description of his very nature. This is the inner secret of his life. This is his life. See, what God is sharing here, he's sharing his life. God is sharing, who he is not sharing his heart, God's sharing his very, his reality. Now fast forward 4,000 years or so, it's Matthew chapter 28. God baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They may have, they may have life. We're the people called by your name. Now we speak the name of Jesus, but it's a human name. It's not with the earth, he has a human name, given to him by the angel, given to him by God, given to him by his earthly parents. But that is connected to the one name. And so by sharing his name, he's sharing his life, he's sharing this friendship. The first thing you do when you, when you meet someone is, is what? Give him your name. Up to this point, people knew God, but he wasn't, he's never shared his name with him. No one called him Yah. No one said, oh, I say I'm a man. No one called him. This is a new thing to Moses that proved to him he's with him. I am your friend, I am with you, I am your God, I am your Savior, I am going to walk with you and to be with you and to save you. It's pretty incredible. This is a pretty important moment here. Where God comes and God redeems and God is there with him. And he also then so he's sharing his life, sharing his being, he's sharing his name. He also says, I'm going to be called forever the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not the God of Moses, no. <laughs> the God of your forefathers. This, this is my name for him. This becomes only, it's, it's a repeated that part of the rest of Scripture. God has sent me to you, the God of Abraham, the Bible, the Moses, the God of Jacob, the God of What he's doing is connecting him to his own life, his being, his nature, who he is, to human being, to human history. He's saying, I am from the covenant so close, I'm going to be known through them. And I'm also going to say, my life is connected to them as well. You can't know me without Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can't. And you can't then, as well, what he's saying is, I want to be so close to you that, so close to that, close to your people, to your forefathers, and into your history. I've come to become part of who you are. And he waits for Moses' choice. He's never forced me, he's, he's annoyed with this. <laughs> I just got to get some it's, it's not an emotion. Um, but he doesn't force Moses. Moses took it and walked away and said, Nope. If you're so great and mighty, do it yourself. God waits for us to respond. God waits for us to come and answer, waits for us to come and to help him to help him with his creation. God waits for us to work with him and to do these things with him. That's what made us. 
And so the assurance is, is, is power, is glory, eternity. It connects it then to our humanity. Ready we have for a glimpse and a pointing to the incarnation. Preparation for Jesus Christ coming, the true God, true man comes to redeem us, who is the eternal one, who is the king, who is the last sentence, who is the same, redeem, and the heal. So we can want that for that forever, but we'll call that good for now. That's third question. So is his name changed farther down the line from Yahweh to something else, to, to God? Wasn't there like two other names? So this is a name, but there, there are titles given by God. So Elohim uh, simply means God. But this is plural, because plural, it's a point in the primitive. Um, Adonai means Lord. And usually what will happen in Hebrew is, in fact, if you, if you go to any book here, I'll make a page here. Um, if you ever see Lord in the Old Testament capitalized, it really is God in Hebrew. Okay. But the thing is, the, the, the ancient Jews, even the time of Christ and beyond that, um, so respected God's name, was only said by one man once a year, uh, in one place, but no other place now. And so they would substitute, they never, never, never say no, they'd always say a lie. And so wherever it's capitalized, it really is Yahweh. And that's, um, and so you'll see things like where, where Pharaoh will say, who is this, this Lord? I don't know this Lord. It's really saying, uh, who's this God? Yahweh. Okay. I know Ra, I know, you know, Set, I know those gods. But there's other things. You'd also have at times, you would have, now this is scriptural, you would have also the name Hashem. You see, in the book of Acts, we have uh, this reference where the apostles rejoiced to suffer for the name Hashem. Um, have um, the Lord of hosts, the Holy One, blessed be He. You have um, El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Yeah. yeah. The same as Adonai. And El Shaddai is, is literally God, the God of the mountains, the God of power, the, the highest, the most high. Uh, so you have the most high. You have, um, my favorite. Just because that's not that it's not that it's scriptural. My favorite is simply the. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Holy One. Which is that Hakadosh. The holy. How about ancient of days? Is ancient that? of days, yeah. These are all titles. Right? So God's name is, is different. These are, these are titles. In the same way that you know your wife and nicknames for you, uh, you know honey bunches. <laughs> it's not your name, <laughs> but she calls it that. You know. um, and so these are all quite the titles because God's name is so sick. It's, it's, it's God Himself. And so, in trying to keep the second commandment, trying to keep God's name holy, the Hebrew people wouldn't speak God's name. It was a, a name for prayer. Uh, even reading the scriptures, they wouldn't say. Um, so we have actually a case where um, Jehovah, you know where Jehovah comes from? The Jewish word? No. Oh. Jehovah is made up of okay. Jehovah is a mistake. Oh. Jehovah, so one of the things they would do is, to, is to remind people to not say this. In Hebrew, they would take the vowels from the mouth and put it over here with the other. <laughs> People who didn't know that would take these, these vowels with this word that came from Jehovah. <laughs> Jehovah means absolutely nothing, nonsense word. Because it's the vowels for the word with God's name. And so, it, so the Seventh day Adventists would call God Jehovah is not. And it came out about the 16th century, that confusion came about. Um, but so this is a nonsense word. Okay. 
So um, it comes about because you have these vowels with that, in that word. Um, so like Yahweh, would that be considered the nature and then that would be the... Well, this is God's name, which is his being in that sense. So God names himself, and the name is the description, the reality, the, the inner heart of who he is. Right? So, so when you call something by name, you know it. You call something by name, you understand it. Because God can't be given a name by human beings, and God can be given a name by parents. And so what God tells us who he is. God's name is his inner reality. Okay. Then we can know him. It's like angels, know angel means, is there calling or their their job yes but their their nature is you know like spirit yeah so yeah okay so but god but this is how you know god this is who he is but poetically you describe his power his glory his authority through these other titles but this is his name whenever you hear god's name it's this and usually when it says lord in the old testament it's all we're talking about this not always to confuse him back to Hebrew. Usually it's, it's, it's Yahweh. Sometimes it is Yahweh. But usually it's Yahweh. Um, because this is God letting us know him. Letting us share his life. Letting us be with him. Letting us receive eternal. Alright, I'm not going to get through this. Shoot. <laughs> 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 it's so interesting. It is interesting. Seriously. I know it says something about me, I don't know. <laughs> so, what does this story of God's call to Moses teach the dark? And first of all, it shows us that God is eternal. So, sorry, my, my plan is to finish, finish the seven points in the poem, I guess. Um, we'll look at the ten plagues next time, and I guess we'll go through Moses probably two or three or four, two weeks, four weeks, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. I hear he's a big deal, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some would say so. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even know his name. It's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the first thing we're learning here is that they got the term, right? So we have his name showing us who he is, his nature, his being, his reality. It's showing us that God doesn't change. First of all, he doesn't change with Moses' stubbornness. But he also is filling promises made to Abraham. Filling promises made to people who forgot him. Filling promises made to Adam and Eve. Right? So you have here the story of God coming to save his people, to redeem us in spite of ourselves. Come and help us, we forgot him. Come help us, we don't know who he is. But we've lost our way and are trapped in places. God coming to save and redeem not just one people, which picks one person, but he used that to redeem all people, save all people, and help all people. You see the God omniscient. God says, I've seen their suffering. He's, he's everywhere. He's known all things. He has understood all things. I have counted their tears, right? And this again, this is something that said Abraham before it happened. It said that Jacob before it happened, there's going to be slaves from the other place for 100 years. Was that last time? God knows everything. He's told God's Almighty. He can do all things, right? See, a human being or someone who's weak. He's going to pick something strong or strong themselves to, to, to solve a problem. If I want to solve a problem, I, I, I have trouble with something. I'm not going to pick something weaker than me to help. Right? If I, if I need help carrying, you know, the table, I'm not going to say, what are the fine, the three-year-old kid help carry the table? <laughs> I want someone at least strong than you're strong. God chooses the weak of the world to shame the strong. He chooses a man who can't talk for him. Doesn't want to want to want to go. Shoot as a man who's meek and humble. Says, "Go from me." God is so powerful and mighty; He's able to use Moses for miracles, make this this great, great figure. 
He works miracles. And we see here at the beginning of those things, he says, Moses, trust me, I'm with you. I'll work miracles for you. I'll prove it to you. Okay, but I understand. <laughs> Be satisfied, I'm done. <laughs> but God can do all things. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. If he can take care of a staff into a snake, if he, if he can do all those things, he can work with us. Who's the God's holy? God is patient with us, but also expects us to follow him. And Moses lacks confidence, there are consequences. God's holy protects on holiness. Because otherwise he'd be able to do it himself. He wants us to be holy in him, to follow him, to be with him, know him. And so he lets us look to him. But, but he also our lines on his cross. There are also places where he says, no more. To bring us out of that, make us holy, to help us follow him, help us to be with him. So we see God's mercy. He doesn't smile on us. He doesn't burn anything. And we'll see in fact on ten plagues, does everything he can to save them. Now all too often, I think, I think we only have one side of that. The one that's, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God will do grace with him. God, you know, tells Moses something to get glory through faith. You read the story. Like, God does everything he can to show Pharaoh mercy. And he says so. We'll look at this next time. So, in fact, Moses was open actually literally goes to Pharaoh and says, God has, could have killed us by now. He hasn't killed you. Wise up. Change. God's mercy. He's merciful to, 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 to he, he, and he sees our tears, our sufferings, even our physical evils, right? It's not just that we're not, we're not just these, these floating souls and, and that as soon as we feel our bodies then we're, we're, we're good. But well, I actually want to care about whether we're hungry or thirsty or tired or slaves. He says, I want my people to suffer. I want, uh, suffering is the result of sin. And so because he's coming to heal sin, to reject sin, because he cared about us personally, he comes even to take care of our physical human ends. This is the beginning of that. It becomes, it becomes more clear with Christ and the incarnation, and even more clear with the resurrection. This is the beginning of that, where he shows us even your physical sufferings, your bodily ills, pain you as a loving and merciful father. And God's faithful. The promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac to Jacob, he comes to with him. I'm coming as the God of Abraham and Jacob, I'm coming as the one who came to make the promise. And even though you are looking for me, I'm faithful to you. Even though you've abandoned me, I'm coming to be faithful to you as God's telling us. So the story we see and understand more about it is not just because of his name. But the eternal, merciful, holy, good, loving Father who comes to save us, to redeem us, and wants us with him. That's the story. That's the story of Acts. That's the story of, of, of the uh, freedom of slavery. And that's why it repairs the way of Christ's coming, it repairs the way the redemption of eternal life. Because all these things, the eternal, the holy one, the merciful, the faithful, and the true, is perfected and fulfilled when Christ becomes man, to save us, to die for us, to resurrect, and to bring us to hell. This prepares the way. Right? Because it's basically what the Lord's saying to us, trust me this far. <coughs> trust me in things you can see and feel and touch. Your, your, your hunger, your thirst, your slavery. And know that I'm coming to redeem you for the eternity. Know that if you, get, if you get this, you'll get the bigger deal. This is the steps. This is, this, this is why when he comes to preach, he always begins the Old Testament. Even after he resurrects. He always begins, the apostles always begin to preach in the Old Testament. And then they go to Christ when he's done for us. This is why we, we have to connect to this as well. On that note, uh, 715, thank you for your patience. Any questions before we call the night? Please. So I'm wondering because Egypt is in Africa, mm -hmm. so that's the East. And I just, I, because we have the story of the Hebrews, 
but we don't have the story of what happened in the East after after all of this. And when Jesus was a baby, the three kings are, you know, symbolic. You know, don't know how many kings. Right. Right. But they came from the East. So they knew the prophecies and the stories. Remember, Egypt is west, though, of Israel. So where, where is that so, reference? Like, where did they come from then? So they would have come from probably Persia. Um, so I have a map on me. Um, <laughs> give me one the Bible. Yes, they would have, the, 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 the three kings would have come from, from Persia. And maybe further. Um, it had, traditionally, one of them was from Africa, who kind of went up there to study or lived there for a bit. Uh, but they were, but they were uh, Persians or Persians. But Persia is what's. So, do you have accounts of who they were and where they came from? We have traditions. Um, we have stories, and we have what leads to the relics over here. Um, Persia. Persian, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so if you look here, so Egypt is here, Israel's here. So East would be over here. So Iraq, Iran, Persia. So, so then, because there were astrologers in East, uh, the Persians were very big into astrology. Uh, looking at the stars. That's why they think the Persia. Um, so we're modern day Iraq area. Okay. So. Um, but could be for a <laughs> But traditionally, there are three of that tradition. They're called Casablanca and Balthazar. Um, and then when they left, they went by a different route, ended up in Europe, and, and died preaching Christ uh, to the Hague nations. And Balthazar was the African one, right? <clears throat> um, I forget that could be correct. But I think I think so. Okay. I, I'll take your word for it. I'm not yeah. sure. But, but they were studying, somehow they got, they got the Persian, they come coming soon. Uh, because, yeah, so Egypt is, is west, east for us, but it's west of where they were. And, and, and was that your question, or were you going? I was just wondering if there were any remnants left in Egypt from the time when the Egyptians and Joseph's hand and that, you know, this was just Pharaoh, Pharaoh was a leader, but maybe there were, like you said, there were intermarriages yeah. and things. Um, certainly there's, there's DNA stuff, and the cities that built are still there. Um, Aren't the Coptic Christians in Cairo? Well, but the, the, those are much later, talking oh. about uh, Joseph, so before Moses. Um, so, I mean, there are remnants, but... Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone has ever found the story from the, the Egyptian side. Um, and there's different reasons for that. There's different reasons for it, right? I mean, so what? So and there's different reasons why, why it might be. One would be, uh, but kings tend not to match their defeats so much as they match their victories. Yeah. <laughs> and so you probably don't want to remind people of how you let the slaves go, and you know, you lost all these people and. Another reason would be the death of the firstborn, you probably had Chang Dynasty. Um, and so you would have had then other people coming into power. Another reason may have been that the certain of these things, things are really important to Hebrews, but not I mean, quite important to the Egyptians. So there's an interesting story, account I found of in the Spain. Um, it was long, it was long in Spain for 700 years. And the some of these battles were ascribed very detailed and very important to the Christians. You look at the, the Muslim accounts, they're seen as minor scriptures. <laughs> now, they're both true. But I would say, yeah, right? I mean, if I were to tell the story of me and a, a, a world conqueror, I came into the room and tried to kill you to escape. Like, telling my story, these ten people escaped, who cares? You know, I, I talk to the world, who cares if people escape? Telling your story, that's going to be a big deal. <laughs> right? You know, you overcame me, you defeated me, you fled, it was great, I was with you. I'm like, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> they finally escaped, who cares? And, and so, some of it, so, so at this point, I, don't, I, I haven't seen it. 
this one is not out there. I haven't seen anything where you have the Egyptian side. Um, I know you have Phoenician manuscripts and the writings when they're wandering in the desert. You talked about the people who wander, the Israelites who wander. You have um, you have things like that. You have references to you know their conquering. You references certainly references afterwards when they were, when they were in Israel. Um, but some of the earlier stuff, it's so long ago and it's so ancient, you just haven't found things that would be like perfectly description, perfectly matched up to everything. And for one reason is no one has tried to keep ancient records like that, preserve them the way the Bible is. Right? You, don't, you don't have people for 5,000 years trying to preserve something like this, and yeah. teaching it, recording it, and keeping it. Um, you know, I mean, the Egyptian civilization had this book in its belt. And they became they became Catholic, <laughs> and then they were conquered by the Muslims, and then so, the, so after all that time, um, it's, just, it's not been preserved in the same way. Um, now, is it, is it possible tomorrow we'll discover something like that? Absolutely, but I just haven't seen it. Questions? I send the prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and conversation with you. As to bless us all present and to help us to understand who you are. Fill us with the glory of your name. And all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Word of the Lord be with you. And and your spirit. Spirit. So I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.